Hello, Foothills Church and happy Easter. Man, we get to celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty. So go ahead and put your hands together. Uh, Let's wake up our neighbors with some screams this morning because it's Easter Sunday and we get to worship together online today. So good to to be gathered online as a church. You know, some of you maybe have just logged on and I wanna make sure everybody knows that you can click on the connect card button below the screen and share any prayer requests that you might have. We believe in the power of prayer and every single request that is given, we're gonna pray over. You can connect with us simple by by just texting FC Connect to the number 97000. Whether it's a prayer request or you're tuning in for the first time, We'd love to know who you are. And if you live in Knoxville, hey, please let us know you're watching today because we actually wanna plan a campus in Knoxville. We'd love to know who you are and we'd love to start connecting with you just a little bit more. Uh, One final thing I'd like to mention is that, hey, next week we start a brand new sermon series that I'm so excited about that we're calling Simply Jesus. We're gonna study the book of Galatians together and I really believe we're gonna learn so much and grow so much through this series. Listen, no matter what we face, financial problems, marriage problems, coronavirus, the answer to your problems is simply Jesus. And we're gonna learn why in this series. So I hope you'll tune in next Sunday as well. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 19. We'll be there in just a moment. You know, obviously we're living in a crazy time. The coronavirus has changed our life. I I never thought we'd be experiencing anything like this. And I watch the news and I just kind of feel like I'm daydreaming sometimes. I mean, everything is shut down. Schools are out. I mean, I don't know about you parents, but that's probably one of the hardest parts about this whole thing is, 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 is becoming a homeschool parent right now. Can I get an amen from any parents out there? It's really difficult. I I feel like I I would pay a teacher to come over to my house to spend a couple hours with me, give us a break from all the teenagers in my house. I don't even care if they have the virus, like we need help. Um, Of course, my my kids, especially my son, he's, he's living his best life now. He's 15. I mean, he's playing Xbox every day, no school. I mean, he finally came out of his room the other day and he said, dad, I just realized I haven't put on shoes in a week. (laughs) And I said, you haven't put on deodorant in a week either, man. Go take a shower. Just because we're quarantined doesn't mean uh, we don't need to have appropriate hygiene. Well, you know, with more time at home, uh, I know a lot of you guys have been watching some some old sports film and some, some old Uh, games and that kind of thing on TV. And a lot of you have been watching them. And I I did some research uh, for today and found a site that had the top 100 finishes in sports of all time. So I spent a little bit of time on it. It was a a lot of fun. And some of my favorite moments in the top 10 were uh, a famous baseball player, Kirk Gibson, uh, the great Dodger. He was he was playing in the 88 World Series, but he was hurt. And at the end of the game, the coach put him in uh, for, uh, for one of the players and he was pinch hitting and he gets to the plate. Uh, he actually hits a home run to win the game. They went on to win the series. That was one of the classic uh, finishes of all time in sports history. I know you'll love this one too. Number eight on this list was in 2002, the college football national championship where the Ohio State Buckeyes defeated the Miami Hurricanes. Amazing win because the Hurricanes were supposed to win. Uh, The Buckeyes were down the whole game. But at the very end of the game, the final play, uh, Miami was about to score to win the game, but the Buckeyes stopped them and they ended up winning uh, the championship. Classic finish in sports history. But my all-time favorite, And this was number two on the list, but I think it's number one. The greatest finish in sports history. I'll give you a hint. It was in the NBA and it was the year 1998. Does anybody know where I'm going? You guessed it. It was Michael Jordan against the Utah Jazz in the 98 championship series. And with seconds on the clock, Michael comes down and he hits a jumper over Byron Russell, I believe, to win the game. It was his sixth championship. It was and Mackey, it was beautiful. Uh, ended up being his last game as a Chicago Bull. What, what an amazing, great finish in uh, sports history. But as good as all those finishes are in sports, it doesn't come close to the greatest finish of all time. 
You see, the greatest finish came from the greatest man who has ever lived. His name is Jesus. And today we celebrate his finished work on the cross and the empty tomb. And so let's start in John chapter 19. We see in John 19, the famous last statement of Jesus before he actually dies on the cross. And it says this in verse 28. It says, knowing that all of it was now completed and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. And in verse 30, and after Jesus was given a drink, he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus's last words were, it is finished. What's ironic is that when Jesus shouted these words from the cross, nobody really understood what he meant. Nobody there had the slightest idea what he was talking about. Of course, the Roman soldiers, they, they hear him and they're like, I hope it's finished. I'm ready to go home. I'm tired of messing with this stuff and we're tired of dealing with Jesus. Pilate was glad it was finished. He thought, man, whew, I'm done with Jesus. Let's move on with life. And of course, the religious leaders were glad it was finished. They thought, hey, our competition is gone now, so we can go back to having all the control. But even the disciples of Jesus didn't understand what it meant. The Bible says after Jesus died, they all ran and hid in a room together. They thought it was over. They thought he was dead and gone. And so uh, I, I think it's interesting that no one there really knew what it meant. Well, maybe you don't really understand what Jesus meant either. Maybe you don't really understand the impact of what that statement is. And so today I wanna talk to you about what Jesus meant when he said, it is finished. Because listen, if his statement is true, it changes everything about your life. It changes how you look at the coronavirus. It changes how you parent. It changes how you live your life. In fact, if it is true, we simply cannot ignore it anymore. First, let's talk about the original language of, of this phrase. The, the New Testament was written in the Greek language and the phrase, it is finished, is actually just one Greek word. It's pronounced tetelestai. And it was a very common phrase that, at that time. And uh, servants and employees would use this term to tell their boss that, hey, uh, we have uh, accomplished and finished the work that you've given to us. It was also used in courtrooms. If you were a criminal and you served your time in jail and, and it was time for you to be released, the judge would say, to Telestai, it is finished. Your debt is paid in full. It was also used as an accounting term. And so if you paid off a loan, the accountant or the banker would stamp the paperwork to Telestai, it is finished, paid in full. Archaeologists have found the word tetelestai written on tens of thousands of documents from the ancient Middle East. And so if you're taking notes, the word tetelestai means to bring something to a successful end, to bring it to its intended goal. So what does Jesus mean when he says that he has brought something to a successful end? What has he finished? I wanna answer that question with three statements today. Number one, if you're taking notes, what Jesus meant was that God's promises have been fulfilled. You know, for thousands of years, God had been promising to send a savior to the world, a Messiah who would forgive and save us from our sins. And for thousands of years, there were hundreds of promises from God. The Old Testament has 380 prophecies about the Messiah. So they're all predictions of what he's gonna do. And so at Christmas, we celebrate the fact that Jesus was born. Finally, the Savior is born. And his birth followed all of the prophecies. His life fulfilled and followed all of the prophecies. And even in his death, it was a fulfillment of the prophecies that were written thousands of years before he was even born. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples. And in Luke 24, it shows us an interesting conversation that he has. He says to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. So remember, this is after he 
resurrected. And so he's saying, listen, I was telling you this back when, uh, back, back before I even died on the cross. He said, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He said, all the stuff that was written about me for thousands of years had to be fulfilled. And then he opened up their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what it was written about. He's saying, I just fulfilled all the promises, all the predictions, all the prophecies that had been given to you. And now what you've got to do is you've got to tell everyone that salvation will come to those who repent and turn from their sin and receive God's forgiveness through faith in Jesus. And so when Jesus said it is finished, he meant that God's promises have been fulfilled. The second thing that Jesus meant when he said it's finished is that the mission has been accomplished, all right? So you might ask, what's the mission? You know, if he accomplished the mission, what exactly was he trying to accomplish? And in Luke chapter 19, Jesus makes it really clear what that mission is. It says that the son of man came here to seek and to save that which is lost. So, okay, the the question then is, um, what does it mean to save the lost? I mean, how do you know if you're lost? You're at home today and you're like, I don't feel lost. I don't think I'm lost. Maybe I'm lost. I mean, what what do we do with that question? Well, to help answer that question, let's go all the way back to the beginning when God created everything and he said that it was good. He created the first man and woman and he named them Adam and Eve and they experienced a perfect relationship with God. He gave them work to do and they actually enjoyed the work and everything was perfect. There was no sin in the world. And God says, you can do whatever, you you can eat whatever you want to eat, except for from one tree. Don't eat the fruit of this one particular tree. And if you eat from that tree, God said, you're going to die. In Genesis 3, Satan comes along and he lies to Adam and Eve. And instead of trusting God's word, they doubt God's word. Adam basically decides to live his life in a way that he felt right instead of trusting God's plan. And as a result, uh, they ate of the fruits and entered the world. And immediately man's relationship with God was broken. So God did what he said he was gonna do. Uh, he, he sent a curse on the land. He cursed the world. And, and so now death is a part of the human experience. Uh, work was uh, joyful before the fall. After the fall, after sin entered the world, now it's frustrating. Uh, part of the uh, curse is now that women will have pain in childbirth. Uh, part of the curse is that in marriage, instead of lovingly submitting to each other as a couple, couples are gonna fight for who's gonna be in control. Part of the curse was thorns and thistles are are now a part of the land, which meant that the earth isn't gonna cooperate with you like it did before sin. There's there's always gonna be obstructions. There's always gonna be earthquakes and tornadoes and disease and viruses and pandemics. You see, because of sin, we live in a broken world. Because of sin, we're all born with that sin nature that we inherited from Adam. So when we were born, you and I are what the Bible calls lost. You see, sin changed everything. Sin changed how God relates to you and I. And and so we all start off in our life really rebelling against God, doing what we want to do instead of following God, doing whatever feels good. We say, God, you you can't tell me how to live my life. And we just kind of do our own thing. And the result of living that way is that we are very broken people. And that brokenness leads to all kinds of pain in our life. It leads to feelings of shame and guilt. And we just don't really know what to do to get rid of those feelings. Uh, We feel empty inside. Sometimes we feel like life is really pointless and we don't know what to do with all these problems and feelings that we have. And that doesn't stop us though from trying to fix those feelings on our own. We, We try to fix that brokenness by engaging in relationships. And so we date and we get married and we hope that that other person is gonna help us feel better about ourselves, but ultimately it works for a while, but inevitably those feelings of emptiness come back because it just, it just doesn't work. We try to fix our brokenness with achievements uh, because when we reach a goal, when we achieve something, it makes us feel good about ourselves. And for a moment, it, it does feel good, but still it doesn't fix that 
empty feeling. And what you've got to realize is that emptiness, that lack of purpose in your life was put there by Jesus. And only Jesus can fulfill that void. Only Jesus can give you hope and purpose in real life. Only Jesus can save you from your brokenness. In fact, here's what the Bible says about it. In Romans chapter three, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. You've probably heard that verse before and you're like, oh man, that's why I don't go to church because they always remind me that I'm a terrible person. But, but here's the reality. We end too quickly on this passage of scripture. We've got to keep reading because the good part is coming. Yes, we have all sinned. Yes, we fall short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. You see, yes, we all fall short of the glory of God, but we are justified freely by grace. The word justified means that when we put our faith in Jesus, God, almost like a judge, declares us righteous. He justifies us. It is a legal term that now Trent is declared righteous. Even though I'm not righteous, by faith in Christ, God looks at me as a righteous follower of Jesus. So it's freely given to us, which means that you can't work for it. How do you think, how in the world can that be free? That doesn't make sense. And you see, that's what grace is. It's a free gift that you don't deserve. If you deserve it, then it wouldn't be grace. It would be earned. And that's why he says his grace is given to you through the redemption that came by Jesus. This was the mission of Jesus, to redeem you, to buy your freedom, to buy your life back. How does he do it? The next verse said that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. What this means is that Jesus took the sin of the world upon his shoulders, your sin, my sin, and he took the punishment that you and I deserved. And he finished what we could not finish. So he could offer us something we could never gain on our own. By dying for you, Jesus paid off the debt that you owed God. You know, you, you owe something to everybody you've ever heard or offended or have sinned against, but, but you're all also in, in deeper debt to God. And that's a debt that you would never be able to repay on your own. But again, the Bible offers us good news. In Colossians chapter two, it says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Isn't that amazing that yes, we, we owed a legal debt to God. It stood against us. We were condemned, but he canceled it. How did he cancel it? He nailed it to the cross by nailing his son to the cross. Can you imagine if you went home um, today or actually you're, you're already at home, but imagine you got news that your bank called you and said, hey, your home mortgage loan, we've decided that we're just gonna cancel that debt. Uh, your debt is paid in full. It, it's all forgotten. Don't worry about making any more payments. How would that make you feel? I mean, you would throw a party. It would be an enormous weight off of your shoulders. You would absolutely love it. And you know what? That's what Jesus did on the cross for you. He paid off the debt that you owed God. But you need to receive that forgiveness by putting your faith in Jesus. That's how Romans 3 ended. It said that we receive that gift by faith. See, in faith, we're saying that we trust that Jesus's death on the cross is the payment. He atoned for our sin. In other words, he paid for our sin by dying. And so faith in him means we are trusting that his death and resurrection pays the price that we couldn't pay. And then that God will forgive us when we trust in that death, burial and resurrection. Finally, when Jesus said it is finished, he not only meant the mission is accomplished, but he also meant that sin and death have been defeated. You see, the reality is everybody has some kind of a fear of death. You you don't find many people that that wanna talk about death. I mean, you're not doing a Zoom call this week, um, you know, from home saying, hey guys, let's get together and you get together and let's talk about death. No, we don't 
We don't do that because it's an uneasy topic. But the good news is that Jesus broke the power of death and sin by dying and raising from the dead. In fact, here's what Jesus says in John 11. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So Jesus is, he, he physically dies. He wasn't just in a coma. He physically died. And on the third day, he came back to life. So he's saying, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And that's how we can know that sin and death are actually defeated. He appeared to hundreds of people after his resurrection. And he said, if you believe in me, even though you die, you will live with me in heaven forever. Every one of us, you see, is gonna die one day. But if you put your faith in Jesus, even though you die, you will enjoy heaven with Jesus and all those who have gone before you. See, Jesus dying and raising from the dead was the greatest finish of all time because it means all the work is finished. And listen, there's nothing else that you need to do to add to the work of Jesus. There's nothing you need to add to that work that he did on the cross. The good news is that you can stop trying to work for God's approval. You can stop trying to fix your own brokenness because there's nothing left to add to the work of Christ. Salvation has already been accomplished for you. It is finished. The death of the lamb gave life to the lion that now roars in me. And that's why baptism is the perfect symbol of our salvation. You see, baptism represents Jesus dying and and being buried in the ground and then coming back to life. And baptism represents that you died to sin. The, The old you was buried with Christ. We go under the water. And as you come up out of the water, it represents that you are a brand new creation. The old has been forgiven. The new you is alive in Christ. And that's why at FC, we don't, sprinkle kids and we don't pour water over your head. We really believe the Bible clearly teaches that baptism is when you physically go under the water to symbolize the burial of Jesus and then the resurrection of Jesus coming up out of the water. You know, the Greek word for baptism is actually the word baptizo and it literally means to be dunked or to be submerged. And I believe right now there are some of you watching that first of all, need to give your life to Jesus. And there's another group of you that need to be baptized. Let me close with this question. Do you believe what Jesus said? I mean, think about it. Do you you really believe the word of God or, or are you just trying to add something on your own to the work of Jesus? Are you trying to measure up or are you trying to get your life together before you make a decision to follow Jesus? If you are, it's never gonna work. You can't fix yourself and then come to Jesus. You've gotta come to the cross of Jesus first and just simply receive his forgiveness. And listen, the moment you believe in Jesus and put your faith in his finished work, God forgives every sin and you stand accepted in Christ. It is finished. And that is good news. The tomb is empty. My question for you is, do you believe this? If you believe it, then it should have changed your life. Many of you watching right now, you need Jesus in your life. Without him, when you die, you're going to spend an eternity separated from God in hell. But today, by faith, my prayer is that you'll turn from your sin. You'll turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I call on you to save me. I put my faith and trust in you. You know, when I was a kid, I knew the Easter story. Uh, I dressed up for Easter Sunday. We did the Easter egg hunt. We ate a big lunch together as a family. We took the pictures. But, you know, at that point in my life, I hadn't experienced a relationship with God. I I knew about Easter. I knew all the facts about Easter, but I hadn't really started to follow Jesus. I had a head knowledge, but I didn't have a commitment to live for Jesus. Maybe you believed some of the facts about Easter intellectually, but today you're gonna let that knowledge sink from your brain 18 inches down into your heart. And as you turn from your sin and you turn towards Jesus, he'll forgive you and he'll make you a brand new person right now. You know, wherever you're listening today, 
Uh, if you wanna give your life to Jesus, I wanna ask you to do something. You might be in a room by yourself. You might be in a room where there's a lot of people in the room. No matter what's going on, here's what I wanna ask you to do today. Would you be so bold as to bow down on your knees wherever you are, if you wanna give your life to Jesus and just say, Jesus, save me today. If that's you, I wanna challenge you to do it right now. Just get down on your knees and, and, and just simply say this to God. Just say, God, I confess that I am a sinner. Just tell him right where you're at. Tell him, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Ask him to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life and save you right where you're at. And then tell him, say, God, I'm gonna live my life for Jesus from this day forward. Tell him. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I believe if you prayed that prayer, that was a commitment that you genuinely made to God that he saved you right here, right now. And we wanna praise God with you. And so I would love for you to let us know that you have made a decision today by simply clicking on the decision button below you. Or it's really simple. You can text us uh, to FC Decision to 97000. And that way you can let us know. We'll send you some resources. We want to celebrate with you. You may need to be baptized. And uh, you know what? The coronavirus is not going to stop us from, from baptizing. And so if you want to be baptized, uh, again, click on the decision button or text us and we'll make it happen. We'll figure it out because we wanna continue to do what God is calling us to do as a church. I am so excited for those of you who have tuned in today, for those of you who have just given your life to Christ, who wanna be baptized. God is gonna do some amazing things during this time of crisis in our world. We're gonna trust him, we're gonna lean into him and we're gonna focus on what he wants to do in our lives. Let's pray together as a church. Father, thank you for Easter. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and giving us hope even in the midst of a crisis like we are facing now. We can trust that you're in control. We can trust that it is finished. We can trust that we do not have to fear death and sin that we can stand in victory today. We don't have to have a spirit of fear, but we can have a spirit of love and of courage because you are with us. All over this city, all over this state, all over the country and world who are turning in today, God, would you bless, would you encourage, and would you do incredible things in the lives of those listening today? And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.